Hello and welcome to a um, session on uh, state terrorism. So I've got quite a lot of slides today and I'm going to talk through them um, uh, reasonably fast, I think. Um, I'm going to start off with rehearsing some of the questions about definitions of terrorism, which we did earlier uh, in the, uh, the, the term. Um, so uh, I wanted to do that because then it allows us to think about the difference between terrorism and non-state and state terrorism. Okay. So what is state terrorism? I'm going to do a brief history of that, uh, some examples of Western state terrorism, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, about counter-terrorism as terrorism. Here, of course, is a famous example of non-state terrorism, which we remember, um, which I had drawn to your attention before, the attack on the Bataclan in 2015 in Paris. One of the worst terror attacks in France in the post-war period. Um, but of course, not the worst, uh, as you will remember. There was the previous occasion where in 17th, on the 17th of October, 1961, probably about 200 Muslims were killed by the police and the military in the streets of Paris uh, after a demonstration. Um, and you can see some photographs of the bodies there and people huddling to get away from the, the possibility of being killed. And this is something which we, I suppose, would describe as um, state terrorism if the term was used or meant something because this is of course state operatives killing civilians uh, and it's a massacre I suppose we call it of which we don't really have a lot of contemporary public memory and uh, that's changed a little bit since Bataclan and it's been memorialised a little bit more and uh, people have sort of remembered that it happened. You can see a uh, Holland uh, at a sort of ceremony to commemorate what happened in Paris in 1961. Um, in the report in the Guardian there. Mainstream or common sense definitions of terrorism, you've seen these before. Course of intimidation, the idea of, of uh, encouraging terror, um, putting the public or any section of the public in fear, says Clive Walker, the legal scholar. And of course, the government's own definition, uh, as given in the, in the Terrorism Act 2000, which is still uh, in force. And I highlight, of course, in the in red, the um, the um, portions that might be of interest is the use of action or the threat of action. Involves serious violence against a person, serious damage to property, endangers a person's life, serious risk to health or safety of the public. And again, that's not what you would think of as being terrorism, I guess, mostly. And that's in the act, as well as this one here. The, is designed seriously to interfere or seriously to disrupt an electronic system. Again, not what you would think of when you, you hear the word terrorism, I, I think. That's probably fair. Um, and so the definition of terrorism is perhaps broader than most people might think. But then, of course, the definition of terrorism is potentially at least vulnerable to um, Politics, I suppose, is the word. Here's um, Chomsky's Pirates and Emperors, worth, worth a look at that book if you ever get a chance to have a look. Uh, he's in the library. St. Augustine tells the story of a pirate captured by Alexander the Great. How dare you molest the sea? asked Alexander. How dare you molest the whole world? The pirate replied. Because I do it with a little ship only. I am called a thief. You, doing it with a great navy, are called an emperor. That draws attention to the 
question of politics and uh, power in the definition of terms like terrorist or indeed emperor or pirate. So here is a uh, Chomsky's famous essay on international terrorism, imaging reality. And um, uh, he, uh, of course, contrasts a literal with a propagandist approach to the definition of terrorism. If you are pursuing the literal approach, you begin by determining what constitutes terrorism, seek instances of the phenomenon, concentrate on the main issues, if we're morally serious, and try and determine the causes and the remedies. Whereas if you're a propagandist, you have a different approach. You begin with the thesis that terrorism is the responsibility of uh, the, the enemy, the bad people, officially designated enemy, and designate terrorist acts only in the cases where they can be attributed, whether plausibly or not, to the required source. Otherwise, they're to be ignored, suppressed, or termed retaliation or self-defense. And he goes on, I mean, to say that it's no surprise that this approach is adopted by governments, but also it's adopted, perhaps more interestingly, by the media and indeed by scholarship in the universities, in Western industrial democracies. And he goes on to say that uh, he wants to qualify Michael Stoll's definition, which uh, he gives there, uh, by pointing to the question of... Um, the great powers, the great powers are, Chomsky says, restricted to favoured states. In the Western conventions under discussion, the Soviet Union is granted no such theoretical, sorry, rhetorical license. And indeed, can be charged and convicted of, on the flimsiest of evidence. Now, of course, the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore, but you, if you think for a moment, you'll not be surprised to um, think of countries which have replaced the Soviet Union in the demonology status, and of course one of them is Russia. China is a bit far further behind, but also there are other um, axes of evil, as uh, it was once put by a US president, countries like Syria, Iran, North Korea, um, Venezuela, Bolivia, etc. Now, of course, the first use of the term in popular usage of terror was, of course, the terror following the French Revolution, the terror to try and defend the revolution against its enemies. Terror is nothing else than justice, prompt, severe, inflexible, said Robespierre in February 1794. Uh, and we can take this on to the period following the revolution of uh, colonialism and uh, the battles over colonialism. Here's Alex, Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, one of the very first sociologists, political scientists. I have often heard people I respect, he says, but do not approve. Deplore the army burning harvests, emptying granaries, and seizing unarmed men, women and children. These are unfortunate necessities that any people wishing to make war on the Arabs must accept. I believe the laws of war entitle us to ravage the country. In fact, we must do this. So I think we are. That's a plain and unapologetic uh, account of what we would call, I guess, terrorism. Uh, it seems to imply deliberate infliction of casualties on civilians. But terrorism is relatively uncommon as a term uh, in, in the French Revolution. It was uh, the terror, it wasn't terrorism, until the 1960s, when a series of uh, air, airplane hijackings by the PFLP associated, uh, most obviously in the popular mind with Leila Khaled, seen in the photograph there. In the 1972 Munich Olympics, kidnapping of Israeli athletes by the Black September, and indeed by anti-colonial movements and uprisings, which were often described in relation to the term terror. And here's the 1972 UN General Assembly um, debating international terrorism following these kinds of events, where there was a sharp division between the Soviet bloc, the non-aligned movement, and the West, 
over the legitimacy of violence by national liberation movements and colonial powers. The, the non-aligned Soviet bloc fight against international terrorism must include state terrorism. And that uh, idea was strongly opposed by the UK, South Africa, Israel, and the US. And there's a fundamental diff diff division over the definition of terrorism. Uh, and you can take this up to date by the move on to the, the new terrorism thesis, which we discussed in previous weeks. The idea that there is a new form of terrorism associated in particular with religion and very specifically with the, with Islam. And the idea that, that uh, terror is no longer, if it ever was, um, political. The, the assumption is that it sort of was political, even although at the time that wasn't very easily admitted. And now it was said that it was apolitical and that the Muslim terrorists didn't have any politics. They were just, um, well, the word would be evil, wouldn't it? There's some kind of term, terminology like that. They were just beyond the possibility of negotiation of politics. So terrorism is thought of as being a non-state phenomenon, even though it starts off as being so associated with states, uh, both in, after the revolution and, in, and in, in France and indeed in colonial times. So how did this happen? Well, the, the argument made by, um, by some key critical terrorism scholars is that there are semantic tricks. States have the capacity to frame public debate about political violence and thus to obscure or erase their own acts of violence, i.e. not to call it terrorism. So there is counter-terrorism, violence, which is called counter-terrorism. There's low-intensity conflict, there's retaliation, there's counter-insurgency, etc., etc. These are terms used to obscure the, the active role in violence of Western states. And this is like double standards, as uh, Chomsky says in his, uh, his famous essay, which I just quoted, uh, this terrorism is antithetical to the liberal state. Liberal states don't commit terror, they don't randomly or systematically kill civilians. Um, terrorists do. And there's a focus on the innocent civilians, the idea that um, that's what terrorists do and not what uh, Western states do. They may kill civilians who are in some ways, I guess, the implication is not innocent. But really, large-scale killing and torture to terrorise wholesale terrorism has been implemented by states, not by non-state terrorists. The reason people aren't aware of this is that states define terrorism and identify the terrorists, and they naturally exempt themselves as always retaliating or engaging in counter-terrorism, even when their own actions are an exact fit to their own definition. So, for the CIA and the FBI, it's common sense, these are the terrorists. People with skin of a certain colour, who belong to a particular religion, might come from a particular part of the world, they are the terrorists. This is the kind of thing you get on a Google image search, I've shown this to you before. These are terrorists, and these are not terrorists. These are images you have to scroll down through several pages of image searches for to find Tony Blair and George Bush or uh, George Bin Bush as it might be said of his uh, photograph with the beard there on the right hand side. Are the terrorists? Well, Western state leaders can be terrorists according to these kinds of arguments. And there we are. Obama is the world's number one terrorist now, not Bush. This is from several years ago before uh, the Trump empire. And here's a demonstration in Peshawar in uh, Pakistan. Terrorist, CIA or Taliban, ask the victims of drone attacks. Of course, the victims of drone attacks are overwhelmingly uh, Muslims in the, uh, in the area of Peshawar or other places with, which are targeted by the US or others. When does humanitarian intervention which is surely what the government said it was doing in Iraq. When does that become state terrorism? When, how many dead children do there have to be before it's regarded as being not humanitarian? I mean, it's kind of the antithesis of, it, of humanitarian to be killing children 
on anything like a regular, never mind a systematic basis. And here's the, the uh, possibility of examining these kind of power differentials and definitions in the mainstream media. This is from the Boston Globe, uh, the famous Fasserman cartoonist, uh, where he's done profiles of Madeleine Albright and Henry Kissinger along the bottom there, two long-time US State Department and Pentagon operatives that transferred, transmogrified into people with skin of a certain color, Mad Ellen Al Barait, Henry K. Singer, and on top there, of course, we've got uh, Augusta Pinochet of Chile and uh, Ariel Sharon of Israel, but both translated into um, different sorts of ethno religious guises to make them seem much more like they might be terrorists. And the same with the cartoons. Uh, and the top right, uh, Kissinger talking about terrorist plots, cover-ups, threats to democracy, and someone saying, is that what he's uh, going to investigate for the September 11th Commission? And the person saying, no, of course not, that's his actual CV. And so, of course, the question of who are the terrorists and the expanding definition of the terrorists is uh, also a matter of political debate. There's Biden talking about uh, Assange being like a high-tech terrorist. The British news staff may face terrorism charges. And uh, dear old Sarah Palin talking about uh, Julian Assange being hunted down like Osama bin Laden. And of course, that's more or less, uh, he's in the prison cell, but more or less what's happened to Julian Assange. Um, and of course, the examples of uh, which we, we talked about last week, really, um, in the, in the section of the election on prevent, of children as potential terrorists, three year olds, uh, animal rights activists, environmental and peace campaigners, possible terrorist threats, and of course, the student who I mentioned last week, uh, interrogated by the police for reading a book on terrorism in his course on terrorism. Now, let's go to the whole question of this, the wholesale versus the retail um, terror. Now, this is a, a slide from Ed Herman and Jerry O'Sullivan's book, um, The Terrorism Industry. And you should look at the, the detail on here. I mean, just look at the the cases and think what you know about them, maybe read a little bit more about, about the background of some of them. But I mean, I'm just going to go over this quickly, but I would like you to come back to this slide. It's really quite an important slide. And let's just pick up the number four in the list there. This is a total of all victims of international terrorism between 1960, uh, what is it, six there? 69 and, and 80, so 11 years. And this is as compiled by the CIA, so it's... Uh, you know, it's, this is not an underestimate. Three and a half thousand people roughly killed by international, oh, international terrorism. And you can compare this with just single incidents of um, state-sponsored, state-backed, indeed Western state-backed terrorism, uh, where, where the, the casualties are in the millions. I mean, ex I mean it's just extraordinary uh, numbers of deaths. Uh, I've given you there the deaths of 9-11, just under 3,000, and the deaths in Southern Africa, meaning South Africa, um, Mozambique, Angola, and Namibia. Over a million people killed uh, in wars backed uh, enthusiastically by the West and indeed by the US, as we saw uh, much earlier in the course with the case of Angola. Uh, the US sponsored Contra in Nicaragua, 81 to 87, 3,000 people. Excess civilian deaths in Iraq between 2003 and 2007, 800,000 to one and a half million, perhaps. I mean, that's really, I guess you can see this, right? But that's a lot of people. That's a lot of dead people. And retail terrorists, you know, don't really have the ability to commit that kind of death and destruction. And here's the, some stats on the, 
casualties in Iraq, because of course this is a heavily contested thing, and the government, of course, contested and tried to contest um, the figures. Uh, and there's also the, um, the questionnaire there, a nationwide sample of UK citizens, uh, asked to ask them about their views of how many people had died. And there we had 44% thought that up to 5,000 had died. And then another 15, 22, 30, 40%. So 88, 84, 85% thought zero to 100,000 people were dead, were killed, excess dead. Uh, only 2% got the correct answer, which was over a million. And another 14% were you know, uh, above half a million, or above 100,000, sorry, you know, which is by, by ten, uh, an order of magnitude of 10 is uh, off the uh, total if you go to the bottom end of that scale of 100,000. So you can see that that uh, popular opinion is, n is not well informed about what's actually happened in Iraq, what actually happened there. Um, uh, although there is peer-reviewed evidence, as I cite there on the slide, which um, gives a way different picture to to, to what most people in the country think. I don't know why there's a University of Bath image there. I'm sorry about that. Um, essentially, this, these two slides are the next two slides are about are slides from um, this is from Dresden in 1945. Is this a matter of state terrorism? Dresden was carpet bombed by the RAF. Um, not for military targets, but to, to cause the high German high command to admit defeat. They carpet bombed the whole city, deliberately targeting civilians. Terrorism, surely. And the same, uh, I'm sorry again about this in the background to the slides, the same uh, in uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima. You can see the destruction there. That was not a military target. That was a civilian target. Again, by any definition of terrorism, that would fit. And you can see the same with all major Western states and pro-Western states. Um, is really state terrorism in, in Gaza? Is it state terrorism? The number of civilians killed there? Well, very large numbers of civilians. Disputed, of course. Um, portions of them being combatants or civilians disputed. But you can see the different estimates there. Uh, and you can, you know, you can make your assessment on that uh, on some kind of basis as a result of that. And here, of course, is uh, the case of the Israelis attacking the Mavi Mamara, the flotilla, the Gaza flotilla. I mean, even mainstream media referred to state piracy in, in Liberación. Uh, El Mundo, conservative paper in Spain, pirates. Israel accused of state terrorism in the Garden, Guardian. Uh, unarmed people simply killed by the Israelis who boarded their boats, who were trying to break, break the siege of Gaza to bring relief supplies, which the Israelis will not allow uh, into Gaza. Is that terrorism? So we can define state terrorism as threats or acts of violence carried out by representatives of the state against civilians to instill fear for political purposes. I mean, that's just a mirror image, really, of the, the official definitions, isn't it? But it specifies that it's carried out by state personnel. Torture, kidnappings, disappearances, rape, indefinite detention, mass killings of civilians by state-run militias or paramilitaries, known as death squads often, home definitions. Deliberate destruction of villages and neighborhoods, civilian architecture, carpet bombing of civilians, all of these things are you know, classic state terror. Uh, often they're called country insurgency, the military strategy developed during the era of British and French empire and decolonization in the 50s. Pacification of local insurgency by Mao in Kenya and the undermining of support and morale of the civilian population. Again, classic indications of, of terror. Uh, that's the, the pacification is about terrorizing the population. So we can see that, you know, that even something like as innocent sounding as counterinsurgency is kind of a euphemism for 
terrorizing your opponent. And then, of course, the doctrine behind Western state sponsored political violence in Central and Latin America and Southeast Asia during the Cold War, leaders of death squads and elite military units were trained at the infamous U.S. Army of America uh, School of U.S. Army School of Americas in anti-communist counterinsurgency training, including torture. E.g., the former president of Guatemala, Rios Montt, and army, army general convicted of genocide and crimes against humanity in 2013. They were trained there. The Phoenix program in Vietnam between 68 and 71, between 20 and 40,000 people killed by US and South Vietnamese military personnel. So, I mean, we need to move beyond a uh, pathological point of view, where politics is discussed in the context of state terrorism. It's presented in a pathological way as a result of abnormal political system, e.g. apartheid as a criminal system, or as a result of abnormalities within the political system, e.g. crimes and human rights abuses of the Indonesian military or the British in Northern Ireland, and the pathological view, as opposed to being routine and almost universal consequence of the politics we can find across a broad spectrum of different state forms, has enabled debates on state terror to be marginalized or erased altogether. Yet extreme political violence, torture, the eradication of civil and political liberties were implemented as part of the strategy of, of political domination by states. So uh, it's not to do with outlying extreme examples of pathological state forms like apartheid that happens even in liberal democracies, as we've seen throughout this um, module. So is it a useful concept? Not all acts of state violence and terrorism, says Michael Stoll. He excludes genocide, ethnic cleansing, as stopping terrorism. Uh, I guess they have their own terms. Would you agree with that? It's a contradiction in terms because states have a monopoly of the legitimate use of violence. It's, le it's legal for states to commit violence. That's why they have an army. Armies are allowed to commit violence under certain circumstances, just they can't break international law or commit war crimes. So maybe it's a contradiction in terms. Maybe it should only be referred to in relation to non-states. And then, what is to be gained by the use of the concept? What's the difference between state terror and terrorism? And do not doubt or deny that states engage in activities intended to spread fear and terror amongst populations. Yes, such state actions are morally reprehensible and should be challenged. But should they be regarded as terrorism? Uh, here's Mark Curtis. You can look at um, the introduction to his book on people here. He talks about the remarkable steps that Britain has taken since 2003 to deepen its support for state terrorism in a number of countries. Unprecedented plans being developed to increase Britain's ability to interfere militarily across the world. Third, the government's increasing its state propaganda operations directed towards the British public. Fourth, Whitehall planners have in effect announced that they are no longer bound by international law. And of course, you'll see in the most recent um, pa passage of the bill in the Commons where it's now to be recognised that state actors are able to commit crimes, including rape and murder, um, and not to be challenged or um, potentially charged for it. So that, the, that process, um, which Mark Curtis talks about there, some 10 or 15 years ago has, has gone like significantly further. Uh, is there British state terrorism? Here's a counter gangs, a report on the undercover military units in Northern Ireland, 1971 to 76, which concludes that senior members of the British security forces were and are prepared to use civilian assassinations, bombings and black propaganda to achieve a military rather than a political solution to the Northern Ireland conflict. The military reaction force in Northern Ireland seems to have engaged in actions which by most definitions would 
be regarded as terrorism. Its existence was deniable. Its tactics were so controversial that it was disbanded after 14 months. And there's a program there on, on YouTube you can watch. Um, Secret Terror Deals, which reveals some of the history of this undercover unit and its engagement in assassinations in Northern Ireland. And there we are, there's more coverage of that. You can have a look at the, uh, the, the clippings there. And of course, the question of Bloody Sunday. We've mentioned Bloody Sunday on a number of occasions. Um, and there we are, Bishop uh, Edward Daly, as he was subsequently, with his white handkerchief trying to remove the dead from the streets of Derry in 1972. Civilians killed, unarmed civilians killed by the military terrorism. And then here, this is Gibraltar killings. You'll remember I've talked about this before as well. That's Marie Farrell there on the right, and you can see her head in the gutter, having been shot dead by the SAS in Gibraltar. And of course, she was a member of the Irish Republican Army on active service. She wasn't a civilian. She was um, effectively military personnel. Does that mean it's not terrorism? Uh, an assassination, perhaps, but not terrorism? You might think perhaps. And there's the famous uh, uh, private eye cover. Why did you shoot him 14 times? I ran out of bullets. And of course, the case of Jean Charles de Menezes, um, about whom the police lied. Uh, he was completely innocent. He was a Brazilian, uh, not Pakistani, and he didn't jump the barrier. He didn't make movements and they shot him dead in Stockwell tube station on after he got onto the tube. And here we have two British uh, soldiers arrested in uh, Basra. They were wearing Arab clothing. They opened fire at a police station, which kind of looks like terrorism. In most definitions, police patrol followed them, captured them, and discovered they were two British soldiers. They had a civilian car packed with explosives. The arrest warrants issued by the judge have no legal basis, according to the British spokesperson, because of the agreement giving British forces legal immunity. So these are quote-unquote terrorists who attacked a police station in Iraq were then released, um, couldn't be charged, the crimes that they had committed weren't crimes any longer because they were British forces and they have legal immunity. Is that terrorism? Is that kind of activity? It looks very much like non-state terrorism, but it's committed by state personnel who are kind of, what are they doing, pretending to be non-state personnel? Or in the case of nuclear weapons, aren't nuclear weapons potentially just terrorist weapons. They can't be used to target motor targets. They inevitably target civilians. Nuclear weapons are state terrorism, says the banner there. And of course, there's a song, I don't know if you'll be familiar with it, to the tune of uh, the Beatles' Yellow Submarine, We All Live in a Terrorist Regime. Uh, words, if you want to look them up, are on the internet. <laughs> a, a, a university in Glasgow has the, uh, like a political song archive in there, housed there on the website. State terrorism. Is it state terrorism? And here, of course, is the uh, not widely known uh, thermobaric bombs. Now, these are deeply unpleasant weapons intended to kill civilians. Um, and that's how they work. They suck all the air out, they kill everybody. This is a secondary explosion. Um, and are these weapons legal? Are they illegal? In 2002, the then MOD Minister Lewis Mooney, uh, a Labour MP, if you recall, said there are no thermobaric weapons in service with the British Army and we have no plans to procure any. So that was a pretty clear denial. The decision to use the weapons came after 18 months of consultation over whether they breached international law. And what the MOD decided was that they would start using thermobaric weapons, but they would no longer call them thermobaric weapons. So that was okay. We no longer accept the term thermobaric as there is no internationally agreed definition, he said an MOD spokesperson. We call them enhanced blast weapons. 
And so the, these weapons were introduced to the British armory by, the, by virtue of a definitional change. They were no longer held to be banned because there, were, there was no international definition of what that banned weapon would be. Uh, simple. Or the case of um, uh, the involvement of the British intelligence services and military in sponsoring non-state terrorism. Here's the case of the secret trial, which you can read up about. The, it was, the, it was a, um, an extraordinary trial where the journalists who were allowed to report it um, could take their notebooks in, but then they had to give their notebooks up on the way, out, way back out again, and probably they, they will never get them back. But why was it secret? Well, a very interesting story appeared in the uh, Daily Mail, of all places, by Duncan Gardham, who was one of the journalists in the secret trial. And he didn't make any reference really to the secret trial, but nevertheless, he told the story, a raising story, of an MI5 agent who was allegedly recruited by a terrorist mastermind in Syria. He was then sent back in Britain, to Britain to plot an attack against MI5. And this was the secret trial. This is the guy who was on the secret trial. He was alleged by MI5 to be a double agent for ISIS. He was sent by MI5 to infiltrate ISIS, and he was allegedly turned and came back to try and attack MI5. And that's, of course, why the trial was secret, because he was an, op an operative of MI5. He was one of their assets. He was an agent of MI5. So there we are. I mean, that, one of the inter interesting ca cases, he, he, uh, the one he hears about all the time, is this: is these kind of cases where the running of agents uh, uh, means that uh, intelligence agencies run extreme moral jeopardy and actually end up potentially supporting actions that they're supposed to be opposing. That is, that's one way of, of, of putting some of what happens. But of course, they, in other cases, they do actually support um, armed violence. And here's the case, of course, of the, the Manchester bomber, which I, I'm sure I've mentioned before, who was the son of a, uh, a Gaddafi era intelligence operative who defected to the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, uh, which itself was involved in attempts to assassinate Gaddafi, sponsored by MI6. And what happened in, in relation to Abedi before he blew all these people up in Manchester? Uh, in a suicide bomb, is that he was taken to Libya by the by the British. The British allowed him to go to, to, to Libya, and then the British um, evacuated him and, and a whole series of other fighters who they'd allowed to go um, to fight Gaddafi. Sorted by MI5, that uh, article there. They, would, they turned up, at uh, a group of them at Heathrow, and the police special branch stopped them. So they didn't know getting in that flight. And they said, yeah, yeah, it's all right, just phone MI5. And they phoned MI5, and MI5 said, yeah, let them go. And off they went to fight Gaddafi, and then were uh, evacuated by the, the, the Royal Navy, uh, uh, and uh, came back and killed all those people on the streets of Manchester. Right? This was a person who was effectively an asset of the British state. Uh, and that, you know, really does illustrate blowback in the most extraordinary way um, uh, for the government. Nobody's been put on trial for that. And then, of course, you know, is there support for terrorism in Syria? Uh, the government have said that they have supported the moderate armed opposition. And it's not always clear that that's a meaningful concept or that the opposition in Syria could be described in such a, such a fashion. So there's the distinct danger, yeah, as Jane Corbyn put it in her panorama program, that uh, um, there's a the, the British government is, is opposing what they call Islamic terrorism in this country, but in other countries it supports it because it meets its foreign policy objectives. That's the, the difficulty that there is with this question of definition of state terror. And there's more, more on the, the uh, Syrian case. And here's the case of um, Errol Estadal. Uh, British had been convicted in secret terror trial mingled with good friends of Princess William and Harry. Um, again, the question of a British intelligence operation in Syria 
And here the case um, of this young woman who went to, to Syria, on the, uh, who it seems were monitored and were known about and were in fact escorted over the border by um, British intelligence operative. Now, we know that MI5 has a child protection policy. Presumably MI6 does too. It's not very clear. Young girls like this are being protected by MI6 if they're being escorted across the border from Turkey into Syria for what purposes we can only speculate. It's not very clear that that's really what they should be doing in terms of, uh, of, of young people who might need um, protected. Here's Paul Wilkinson, the doyen at the time of terror experts uh, up until around about the mid-2000s when he, uh, he died. Central point I wish to make is this. Mistakes and acts of misconduct by a handful of serving soldiers should not blind us to the fact that the British Army, UDR, the RUC, at the cost of hundreds of their members' lives in the 27 years of terrorism, have made a colossal achievement in preventing the conflict from escalating to a civil war. A truly heroic record, and it should be fully recognised as such by both the British public and the international. Now, you, you can't reconcile that kind of account of what the British government were doing in Northern Ireland with the accounts that have been given of undercover operations and assassinations uh, by the British, totally outside the rules law. And, and you, you know, so you have it's one or the other. One of them is true, or or, or the other is true. You can't both be true. And you 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 know you find that out by evaluating the evidence. I guess. So, we come to the end. A, a preliminary conclusion. Whether we use the term terrorism or not should not obscure two basic points. The importance of connecting state and non-state political violence. It's fun, as Wilkinson says, it's a fundamental truth that one cannot adequately understand terrorist movements without paying some attention to the effects of violence and force and violence by states. Now, of course, he's talking about enemy states. But it, the point applies to liberal democracies too, and of course that's true. You know, the, people don't take up arms for no reason. They might be mistaken. Their politics might be bad, but they don't take up arms for no reason. And uh, you know, people take up arms largely in the context of conflict. All of the literature, which is properly, uh, you know, properly examines such things, concludes that you know the conflict is what causes conflict, and conflicts are are sometimes initiated by by Western states. Um, and also the second point, the second conclusion, never take official discourse at face value. Never believe what the government says without thinking it through and working out what's going on. Can we accept that counterterrorism is indeed always conducted with the aim of eliminating or mitigating terrorism? Or is it... We might question whether state terror, rather than being some kind of unintended consequence of counterterrorism, might indeed be its originary purpose. So, I mean, there we are, the, the question of whether this is all just a question of terror or whether we don't, we don't use the term terror anymore and we, we, we move beyond it. Uh, it's kind of a, that's kind of an open question, uh, one that I don't come to a, a judgment on in, the, in this course and I, I guess you might come to a judgment, but it's a, it's a, it's a tricky thing to do. Anyway, there we are, that's the end. Um, I'll speak to you again uh, on uh, uh, tomorrow at the seminars. Okay, goodbye.